What's going on everyone, it's Griffin here. And in today's video, we'll be speaking about my process for how I go about researching and analyzing companies that I'm interested in potentially investing in and really what criteria I look for when I'm researching these stocks, both from a business standpoint, but then also from an underlying financial standpoint, which of course, both are highly important. I make videos all the time going over stocks on this channel and highlighting certain elements about them. So of course, over the years, I've had dozens of viewers ask me to make a more condensed video uh, going over everything that I pretty much look for when I'm analyzing new companies. After all, if you've been a subscriber to this channel for a while now, then you would know that I'm a strong advocate for proper analysis and due diligence on a company before you end up potentially buying their stock. There needs to be a reason for the buy and a thesis as to why you believe this company will do well over time, over the course of time that you hold their stock, that is, relative to your goals as an investor. And since there are just so many public companies to choose from, cherry picking those quality stocks can be a real challenge. I mean, fund managers and analysts literally dedicate their lives to try and find the stocks that show the most amount of growth potential. So don't beat yourself up if you ever have trouble finding good stock picks. Assessing the quality and worthiness of a stock for your portfolio is a lot more than just one or two nuggets of information. It's a well-rounded and full comprehensive assessment of a company's business growth along with their financial performance and their future business and financial growth expectations. And I think it's important to mention at this point that regardless of how much due diligence you do on a company, and how attractive the stock might look on paper, the reality is that you will pick winners and you will pick losers. That's just the name of the game. But with certain criteria, like what we'll be speaking about in today's video, hopefully you'll be able to better identify green along with red flags about certain companies, making the whole analysis process a bit more seamless. So with that said, typically when I'm analyzing a new stock, I look at five key uh, main like sections of data essentially, and those are related to the balance sheet figures, past growth of the company, future expected growth, their dividend if they even have one and it's a dividend stock, and then also the uh, current value and ratios of the company. So I was initially gonna put all of those into one video today, but as I was writing it out, I realized just section number one, which we're gonna be doing today, uh, ended up being about seven pages. So if I did the entire thing in this video, would be well over an hour long. So I decided to split it up into three videos. The two other videos in this series that'll probably be releasing uh, over the next week or two are going to be about uh, the balance sheet, past growth, future growth, as well as dividends. So yeah, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you do, make sure to smash the like button. That's pretty much all I ask in return for watching my video. So let's get right into it. All right, so diving into that first section of elements that I look at when I'm analyzing a stock, that is the current value along with current value ratios for the company. And this pretty much includes the current market price, the market capitalization, price to sales ratio, price to earnings ratio, price to earnings to growth ratio, and the price to book ratio, all of which we're gonna be breaking down right now. These are ratios that help investors such as ourselves quickly value a stock's market price relative to its underlying financials. For example, the revenues, net income, and book value among others. So of course though, like pretty much everyone else, one of the first things I look at is the current stock's price in the market along with the market capitalization which in all honesty though, really doesn't give us all that much context about the stock and the company other than pretty much how large the company is as of right now. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of retail investors spend way too much time simply tracking the price movements for a stock they're interested in instead of spending time tracking other financial information that is way more relevant and telling as to how this company is actually performing and what the stock should be fetching later on in terms of valuation. Right, so one company whose stock is trading at say $10 a share versus another company that stock is trading at $1,000 per share. This literally means nothing in the big picture other than the fact that one company's stock in terms of dollar value is more expensive, but it's not actually more expensive necessarily from an underlying financial standpoint. This is just a reflection of the company's market value relative to its outstanding number of shares out in the market. And with that said, I see a lot of newer investors basing a lot or a large portion of their research on price movements of a stock only and only whether or not the company's stock is uh, a large value or not. But that can be somewhat dangerous because history has shown us that over time, a company's stock price is highly correlated with its underlying growth in fundamentals. So if you're just looking at a stock that's say down 30% in market price, you might be thinking that this stock is undervalued. However, you might also be missing out on a much larger piece of the bigger picture here. 
I know this might seem pretty obvious as I'm telling you right now, but for real, this is a lot more prevalent than it should be. And that's not to say that market price isn't important. It's very important because the price that you get in on a stock is going to pretty much determine uh, the potential appreciation that you can materialize on that given stock. What I'm saying though is that the overall value of the company as a whole is a lot more important in the type of appreciation that your shares are going to be worth over time as that whole company grows in value. Anyways, I went a bit on a tangent there, but let's get back to the market cap. So market cap quite simply is the value value uh, in the market of one share multiplied by the amount of outstanding shares out in the market. So depending on how many shares a certain company has in the market and the market price for each one of those shares, that is what's going to determine the market cap or market value really of that company. And in the equity markets, companies of similar sizes will tend to hold certain similar characteristics, not necessarily about the companies themselves, but more in terms of volatility along with potential speed of growth. This therefore categorizes companies into micro cap stocks, small cap, medium cap, large cap, and now massive cap stocks pretty much like the Apples and the Amazons of this world. The next thing I look at is the price to sales ratio, acronym PS ratio, which you've probably heard me speak about multiple times on the channel in my past stock analysis videos. Basically, this ratio divides the company's current share price by the revenues per share over the past year. Or you can also, on a larger scale, divide the market cap of the company by the trailing 12-month revenues. And this tells us, well, how much is this stock trading for relative to the sales of the company over the past year? So for example, a company that were to have a price to sales ratio of two, this means that their market cap is double the amount of sales that they made over the past year. Same thing would apply for a PS ratio of four, the market cap would be four times the sales of the past year. And generally speaking, a lower price to sales ratio is going to be favorable because this means that the stock is trading at a value that is much lower in relation to their sales over the last year. A price to sales ratio of say 50 is a very expensive company. But of course, more context is also necessary because a higher price to sales ratio could mean that investor sentiment in the market is very bullish towards the future growth of a given company. And a higher price to sales ratio could also mean that a lot of that future expected growth though is already priced into the company, setting the bar quite high for future expectations and earnings. And finally, the price to sales ratio is also a relevant ratio to use for a company that is in extreme growth mode and doesn't necessarily have any earnings to show for, and therefore they won't really have a price to earnings ratio because, well, there's no earnings really. So this is a ratio that can be used for a growth companies like, for example, a Shopify, a Lightspeed, etc to uh, base itself off of its past valuations. Now, every industry though is going to commend a different average price to sales ratio. And so as the investor, I like to look at, well, how is the price to sales ratio right now of a given company stacking up against its own price to sales ratio over the past three years, along with the price to sales ratio average of the market as a whole and the industry that it operates in. Taking a look, for example, at Corsair Gaming, which is a company that I am a shareholder in and have spoken about quite a bit recently. Well, this company's price to sales ratio as of right now is 1.66, meaning that their market cap is, you know, roughly 1.6 times higher than their sales over the past year, which is really low in this current market environment. In contrast to this, Nvidia's price to sales ratio is 23x, which is quite expensive. So looking at the company's price to sales ratio right now and then comparing comparing it to the market and industry averages is something I always like to do. But then to get a bit more context, I also like to compare it to its own historic PS ratio over the past three years or so. And a website I use to do this is called Macro Trends. For example, this is the PS ratio of Shopify telling us that over the past year, yes, you know, sales have increased dramatically, but with the stock price also increasing in relation to this, well, investors have started paying a much higher valuation for this stock than they have previously. And for a company like Shopify that previously did not have any earnings for a price to earnings ratio as a nice metric to look at, well, the price to sales ratio is a good alternative. The next ratio I look at is of course the price to earnings ratio, also known as the PE ratio. 
And similar to the price to sales ratio here, well, the PE ratio divides the company's current stock price by the earnings per share over the past 12 months. This can also be done by the market cap divided by the total net earnings over the past 12 months. And what this will give us is what's known as the TTMPE or trailing 12 months price to earnings ratio. And that's because it is based on concrete data over the past 12 months. There's also what's known as the forward price to earnings ratio, and that is based on projected earnings for the company over the next 12 months. But for right now, we'll be focusing on the trailing 12 month PE. The price to earnings ratio though is more widely used than the PS ratio because it's actually taking into account the net earnings of the company, which is highly important for the sustained growth of a company. A firm that is consistently unprofitable year after year still has to sustain their operation somehow. And typically this is going to be in one of two manners, either by taking on a lot more debt to sustain their operations or by raising capital through share issuances which dilutes shareholder value, both of which ultimately are not favorable for the shareholders. And with that said, some companies that are unprofitable won't even have a PE because there's no net earnings to plug into the equation. And generally, the higher the PE, the more richly valued the company is. So if we take the example from earlier of NVIDIA, well, their TTM PE right now is around 84x, meaning shares are trading at 84 times the profits of the company. That is extremely expensive no matter how you justify it. When doing a quick assessment, though, I look at the current PE and ask myself, does this make sense to me? And also in relation to the industry it operates in. Then I also compare it to its own historic PE ratio over the past three years or so, or sometimes even farther out. But after around three years, the market's changed so much that I tend to stick to that three year timeline. And this can once again be achieved through a platform like Macrotrends, where here we're seeing that the stock is basically trading at a higher valuation than it ever has before. And some companies can commend a much higher PE ratio if they are expected to grow their underlying earnings at a much quicker pace over the next, say, five years. But at a certain point, you need to ask yourself, well, am I overpaying for this stock? And then also consider the fact that when a stock is trading at a really high PE, there are quite a few expectations already priced into the stock price. So even if the company is crushing earnings quarter over quarter, this can sometimes result in stock price stagnation. For example, what we've seen with a lot of large cap tech stocks over the past couple of months, they've been crushing earnings, but the stock price hasn't really been seeing that much positive movement. All right, moving on to the next ratio that I like to look at, we have the price to earnings to growth ratio, acronym PEG ratio for short. And as the name would suggest, the PEG ratio is a nice quick way to assess a company's current market price relative to its net income and also taking into account its expected growth rate. So essentially, this is one notch above the PE ratio and tells us that, well, considering the level of growth for this company over the next couple of years, is the PE ratio high or is it low? To get this ratio, you divide the company's PE ratio by their expected earnings growth rate over a given period of time. On Yahoo Finance, for example, the PEG ratio will use a company's trailing 12 month PE along with their five year expected growth rate. So with this in mind, the lower the PEG ratio, the more the stock could be considered to be undervalued in relation to its expected growth rate. Remember that I'm always looking to invest in companies that I see having potential over the next three to five, sometimes even up to 10 years down the line. So if I'm investing into a company that has a really high PE ratio and a very high PEG ratio, well, the potential upside for this company might be limited. Now, based on the equation for the PEG ratio, if a company's price to earnings is the same as their expected level of growth over the next, say, five years, the PEG ratio would be at one, meaning that the stock is properly valued. In fact, Peter Lynch, who wrote this book right here called One Up on Wall Street, good read, by the way, if you haven't already read it, well, he says that a company's PE ratio should be equal to a company's net growth rate over the coming years, or expected growth rate, I should say. So with this in mind, a company that has a PEG ratio above one could be considered to be overvalued, while a PEG ratio below one could be considered to be undervalued. Now, I typically like to see a PEG ratio that falls anywhere between zero and one 
one when I'm specifically looking for a more undervalued company. And what this essentially tells me is that the company's expected growth rate is higher than the current PE ratio. I'll be honest though, in this current market environment, finding a PEG ratio that is below one is quite difficult as most of the market is quite inflated right now. So basically what I'm saying is that, well, it's nice to see a PEG ratio that's more reasonable. Don't necessarily just take this at face value because you could be missing out on very nice opportunities for growth longer term. For example, Amazon has a relatively high PEG ratio based on what I just mentioned, but that doesn't mean that this company isn't going to produce very nice returns for investors over the next decade. And back to our example of NVIDIA, it has a PEG of 1.46, meaning it's commending a high value. In contrast to this, Go Easy, which is a company I've been speaking about since around the $70 a share range, it has a PEG of 1.09. And finally, the last ratio that I just quickly look over is the price to book ratio, acronym PB ratio. And I say quickly because when I'm assessing the overall financial position of a company, I tend to look a lot more into the actual balance sheet figures and unpack those. So that is something that we're going to be speaking about though in probably part two of this series. So the PB ratio though is just a quick assessment of the company's share price in relation to its underlying book value. Generally speaking, a price to book ratio at or below 1.5x is going to be considered a favorable PB ratio. But in the current market environment with again, somewhat inflated price points, most investors will tolerate a PB ratio at or below 3x. But even still, the price to book ratio should only really be considered as a small portion of a much larger analysis on the company's financial position and balance sheet. So that pretty much wraps up the first part on this video series where in today's video we looked over stock ratios and this can give us a good depiction and idea of how a company is currently valued in the market. In part two of the series we're going to be looking over the company's past growth along with future expected growth potential and then in part three we'll be looking at the dividend if the this is a company that does pay out dividends along with the financial position of the stock. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and also consider subscribing and hitting the bell button so that you are notified of those upcoming videos in this little series here. And if you wanna still open up a brokerage account, make sure to check out the links down below. You can open up either a Quest Trade or a Wellsimple Trade account and you'll get some free money for doing so. I'd also highly recommend that you check out my full 60 video lecture stock market investing course where you can learn everything you need to know about getting familiar with the stock market, navigating it properly and building your own portfolio suitable for your needs as an investor. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching and I will see you in the next one.